welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I am Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. Last week, you, you mentioned that you are currently deployed. How soon are you going to come home? I'll be home uh, pretty quickly for me. I'm not sure where it is relative to uh, you know actual publishing dates, but I've only got a few weeks left. And I'm excited and sad all at the same time, right? Those complicated emotions we get when we... Uh, we go somewhere far away and do something exciting and fun and, and worthwhile. But boy, I miss home. I miss my car. I miss my bed. I miss my family. Um, in that really order? Excited. No, absolutely <laughs> not in that order. I left the family for last so that it was the thing that dwelt in people's minds most immediately. Got it. Yeah, yeah. See, the th- other things I said, you've already forgotten. But it's the family. That's the, that's the one that's dwelt. <laughs> but yeah, I am really looking forward to getting home. So. I'm already kind of in that, we call it trunky, right? Where you've already packed your bags in your mind and you're already kind of halfway there. Trying to focus, trying to get the job done. But yeah, I'm looking forward to getting home. Yeah, I imagine that after having your family there for the Christmas holiday and then having them leave did not necessarily improve your desire to stay any longer. And I imagine that you wanted to get on the airplane and go home with them. I did. Yep, absolutely did. Well, so when you do get home, what's next for you? What are you going to be doing for the Air Force? I'm not sure I can say publicly, but I'll tell you. (laughs) Do you know? I don't. I'm going to the White House. Oh, no, I had no idea. Yeah, so the agency I work for has an Office of External Engagement, and I will be working to support the Office of the President and the Vice President at the National Security Council at the White House and Eisenhower Building. Wow, that's yeah, really awesome. What can you say publicly? Can you say that you're just going to go back to Fort Meade and... Yep, just head back to my home unit and continuing on with my internship. You know, it's kind of a choose your own adventure and I've got some things lined up. Pretty excited about it. How much longer do you anticipate being in that national capital region? Uh, so I'll be there through 2021. Summer of 2021 is when I move next. So fingers crossed, hoping for some leadership opportunities. We'll see what shakes out. Also looking forward to promotion board results. So our promotion board met in December of 2019 for both you and I, Colin. So hopefully this summer of 2020, we'll have some good news and we'll see some oak leaves in our future. Uh, Actually, I want to clarify that I did not meet that board. Reason being is when I left active duty and then had my break in service, because I was in the IRR, the Individual Ready Reserve, that time that I spent in the IRR did not count toward my time and grade and time and service. So I have not yet met my majors board. That will happen for me February of 2021. Got it. Okay. So Reed, you're going to put those oak leaves on before me and I will salute you smartly, sir. Okay. That'll be weird. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, so that's kind of what's, what's in the future. Very cool. Looking forward to it. As for me, I am in my last semester of Air Force ROTC at Brigham Young University and Utah Valley University, Air Force ROTC Detachment 855, and currently looking for whatever my next job is going to be. Now, I submitted an application to the Air Force Honor Guard. I, had, I have a desire to go and be the Director of Operations for the Air Force Honor Guard, I feel like that would be an excellent follow-on assignment, kind of postdoctoral place to be after having studied military drill so much in depth over the last four or five years. And it would be the next step as far as my career progression and development as an officer, my leadership progression. However, because I am a reservist and the Air Force Honor Guard position is active duty only, I can't go there. I'm not eligible for it. 
Now, there is a possibility that the Air Force Honor Guard could convert some of their positions to reserve billets, and I could become a what's called an IMA, Individual Mobilization Augmentee, and support the Air Force Honor Guard on a part-time basis. But as of yet, that hasn't happened. I'm looking at other possibilities, a return to the traditional reserve as a civil engineering officer or potentially cross-training into other career fields, even looking at going into Intel. There is a need for Intel officers at Hill Air Force Base, where which is the closest base to me. I'm also interested in the possibility of moving to Colorado Springs to work at the Air Force Academy in either as faculty or as staff and continuing to wear the uniform in a reserve part-time capacity, especially with the Space Force coming online. They're going to you know, soak up a lot of money and oxygen in that area. So I imagine that there would be some opportunity for me there. But as it stands right now, I don't know what my next job is going to be come July 1st, 2020. Would love to be able to tell you what I'm going to do, but I don't know. If anybody out there is listening and wants to give me a job, especially one that will allow me to continue wearing the uniform and uh, take care of my family, then I'm all ears. You can reach out to me and help me find something that is going to make sense uh, for me and my family. But that's where I'm at, Reed. Someday you'll figure out what you're going to be when you grow up, right? Just like all of us a little bit. (laughs) Right. All right. Well, good update. Let's round out this discussion that we've been having about what the Air Force values in its officers. When General Goldfein published this memo to his wing commanders, he outlined the four things that we value, executing the mission, leading airmen, managing resources, and improving the unit. And then he said, these core competencies all ride on a foundation of impeccable character. Now, interestingly enough, those four values all come from AFI 1-2. They're outlined explicitly there. However, one will search in vain for guidance or any sort of official AFI that fully outlines what is meant by a foundation of impeccable character. Now, we discussed this a little bit back in our very first episode released in September on what is an Air Force officer. In that episode, we cited AFI 36-2005 for officer accessions and the requirement for officers to be of, quote, sound moral character. And I lamented at the time, Reed, if you remember, that AFI refers primarily to criminal activity and drug use. But I don't think that is exactly what General Goldfein is after in describing what the Air Force values in its officers. So I'm asking here again, and I think that's where our discussion needs to be today, is what is meant by a foundation of impeccable character? Beyond crime and drugs, what is it that the Air Force is looking for? What do you think, Reed? I think it's a great question. And as I was doing research for this, and I know you stumbled upon the same thing as we were kind of looking into this, I found myself on the Air Force Academy's main website. So usafa.edu. And right at the top, in one of the most top line, you know, if you look at the website in the hierarchy, right, you've got the homepage. And you kind of have the most important subjects that are linked on that page. And one of those topics, one of those tabs is character. And you go to this character tab and the Academy has an entire center focused on this idea of character. And it it really, you know, it's interesting as I think about this idea of like, what is character? Because it is foundational. It is completely, I mean, it underlies everything we do, yet it shouldn't even need to be addressed because it's foundational. You know, it's there. It's always there. It's like the earth we walk on. We don't think that the earth is there or really always consider it, but it is always there. And it's one of those things that we do need to speak about a little bit because it is the foundation of what we do. Yeah. In that website, the Air Force Academy defines character as, quote, one's moral compass some of those qualities of moral excellence which move a person to do the right thing 
despite pressures to the contrary. What do we think of this definition? I like it. It's also highly circular. Um, you know, your moral compass and then uses moral excellence further on in the definition, you know, so it definitely is one of those things. I feel it's like that famous example where when speaking of illicit material or graphic images, uh, you know what it is when you see it. And we've kind of used that reference before, but I think you know what character looks like. You certainly know what a lack of character looks like. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is even if you don't necessarily know what right looks like, you certainly know what it looks like when there is an absence of character, when somebody certainly has it wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to go through some examples here. And, and I think that'll clearly define what wrong looks like. I do like the last bit of that definition where it says, move a person to do the right thing despite pressures to the contrary. I think to me, that's really like the next level. That's this place where we really want to be is there will be pressures to not be excellent, to maybe not always give your full effort or to hide or to not step up. And some of my most important experiences I've had as an officer in the Air Force is watching leaders, despite pressures that would normally cause people to shrink, but to stand up and just take whatever came, you know, and I've got, you know, one in particular, I recall, uh, we were at OTS, a graduation went very poorly. We had a very high level visitor. We got a lot of distinguished visitors at OTS. When officers are commissioning, it's like, bees the honey, you know, officers love to be part of other officers, graduations and promotions. It's fantastic. I really, truly enjoyed it. We had a very, very important visitor and the graduation wasn't bad, but it was not good. And it certainly did not meet the standard we were used to. And the group commander who I worked for at the time, I mean, the crass isn't even come back up right after being marched on. I mean, we had just wrapped up graduation. And he told me to go find the squadron commander and everyone who was in charge of graduation. He wanted him in his office immediately. And I knew this was going to be a fun conversation. And he was very displeased. I gathered up the folks and that squadron commander stood in front of 12 or 13 of his people and said, sir, I failed to achieve air superiority. I did not do what you asked me to do. And he just completely took it. And to me, that was character. He could have turned and said, well, yeah, this guy did that and that girl did that. And yeah, they sucked. But no, he absolutely said, no, this is my mission. I'm the officer in charge here. This was mine and I'll own it. And I think to me that idea, despite the pressures to the contrary, you don't want to take that shot in the face. So you don't want to do that. But he did. And I think that's something that I definitely keyed on as I was going through this research. Yeah. What you're describing there is a leader of character. And the Academy website defines that further for us as someone who lives honorably, consistently practicing the virtues embodied by the core values. And I think that's one of the things that the squadron commander in your example displayed there is integrity, that he recognized that there were mistakes made. And those mistakes very well may have been made by people that he had delegated authority to. They absolutely did. You know, the, the squadron commander's got a lot going on. And yes, absolutely were delegated tasks. Right. But the squadron commander had the integrity to realize that ultimately responsibility falls to him as the commander. That is how things should be. So he had the integrity to say, hey, this is on me. Yeah. He could have said, this person was wrong, this person was wrong, this person was wrong, but he didn't. I don't think that that's what the group commander was looking for. I don't think he wanted to hear a elicited out explanation of everything that went wrong. I think he just wanted the squadron commander to take ownership. Yeah, it was hard to know because, you know, in one degree, I could see the group commander being frustrated because we weren't getting to actual solutions because we weren't addressing specifics, right? Instead, I found, you know, the squadron commander almost leading up, if you will, and diffusing the situation, giving the group commander an out, saying, got it, sir, you are unhappy, we'll fix it. And then I'm sure he went back to his squadron and they had another heart to heart where they actually got down to the nitty gritty. But that interaction showed me what character looked like. Yeah. And I wish it happened more often. Sometimes it doesn't. But boy, that was a great moment for me to see that happen. And I told that commander so. I wanted him to know how much that meant 
for me to see someone to just stand up and take it like that. Yeah. So again, you're describing another core value, service before self, leading up, taking the blows instead of putting your airmen out in front of you and watching them you know, get reamed by a group commander. He stood there and protected his people. Yeah. Now, like you said, he probably went back and had that heart to heart, tough conversation with the people that failed, but he didn't do it in front of leadership. Yeah. Now, it was a great thing that I remembered as we were talking about it right now. Continuing on with the Academy's definition of a leader of character, it says lifts others to their best possible selves. And then finally, elevates performance toward a common and noble purpose. So I think what the Academy captures here is, is a good start for what we're looking for with regards to this foundation of character. As I explained in our first episode, I'm, I'm not fully solidified on my own personal definition of character, just as the Air Force doesn't seem to have an official definition of it. But here are some thoughts of what I think right looks like, what should be part of someone's character. I think it's necessary that they have some sort of moral code or ethical center. Now, this may come from a religious background. It may come from a study of philosophy. It may be just the way that that's the way the mama raised me, you know? But I think that there has to be something, some sort of set of principles that a person can look to and say, these are my guideposts. These are the things that help me make decisions about what is right and what is wrong. I think that has to be in place. Now, that goes against what seems to be more and more popular in world today is this idea of moral relativity, that what's right for one person is up to them, that you don't get to project your morality on other people. But I think that as an officer in, in the Air Force, that is a requirement that whatever your moral compass is, moral code or ethical center is, you have to project that onto the mission, onto leading your people, how you manage resources, how you work to improve the unit. I think that is central in all of that. I think that's something that will become a natural growth from effective training, especially at basic training, ROTC field training, and at officer training school and USAF and these other initial accession sources. Because you're going to be tested and you're going to be evaluated against right and left posts, I think those without those moral guideposts tend to fail. That was my experience as an instructor. Those who had moral relativity did not last long in training because we were giving them right and lefts and telling them where they needed to be. It sounds cliche, but our core values absolutely can be those things if you don't bring those already with you to the table. Yeah, totally agree. And those without those did not succeed at OTS. Another one that is on my mind with regards to character is that someone needs to have some sort of conviction or passion for pursuing the good and the true. Now, what do I mean by that, Reed? Anyone who wants to be an officer in the Air Force needs to be looking for things that are good and not just good. We need to be looking for things that are better or best because the world is full of all sorts of good things. And we can fill up our lives with just good things, but we don't have enough time. We don't have enough resources. We don't have enough energy to just pursue the good, but we need to seek after things that are of the most good, things that are better and best. And in addition to that, we need to look for the things that are actually true, that are rooted in reality, that are fact. In our previous episode, you explained how to know if something is right or how to do the right thing. And you explained that you can know that something is right if it is repeatable, reputable. And what was the last one? Transparent. You can do it in a transparent way. That's right. And I think that is a great way of looking at truth. Is it something that is repeatable? Is it going to be the same in every situation? Is it reputable? Is it something that we seek after? And I think that kind of goes along with being of the most good. And is it transparent? Is it something that you feel comfortable sharing with other people, especially your airmen, the people that you are trying to lead? I think that it's really important that an officer in the Air Force pursue the good and the true in that regard. What do you think, Reed? No, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that 
what you're getting at this pursuing the true. I think we've talked about multiple times how important it is for an officer to be able to accurately and consistently assess self to know where you are relative to right in order so that you can continuously improve yourself. And I think that this is consistent with that. Not only do you have to be true to yourself and understand where you are, but you have to continue to look for that elsewhere around you. And that comes from a culture, from a belief, from a perspective. It's not something that you achieve. It's absolutely something that you have to be. Yeah. My last thought here on this idea of character is I think an officer needs to have genuine care for their people. In my previous episode, I I described this as being a father or a mother figure to your people, a genuine love for those people. But at the same time, having that professional distance in that you are requiring these people to do some things that are not necessarily what they want, but is ultimately for their good and for the good of the mission. I don't think this is necessarily the case everywhere in business, in the private business world, but I think that out in the business world, the bottom line is pursuit of profit. Right? That's kind of the idea of capitalism is pursuing more money, more revenue, more production, more efficiency. But we in the Air Force have to view our people as a resource themselves. And we have to treat that resource as something of the utmost value. They're not just cogs in a wheel. They're not just gears in a machine. They are our most precious resource and we need to protect them. I think that's one of the most important responsibilities an officer is to take care of their people. And so I think part of character needs to be that genuine love and that genuine care for the people that they lead. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And again, in that story I shared earlier about that squadron commander genuinely caring for their people. Uh, Yeah, totally agree. Reed, do you have any other ideas, things that you would want to add to this idea of character that the Air Force values that we need to have in our officers? No, you know, like you, Colin, this has been a tough one for me. You know, I've really given it a lot of thought. And the more I think about it, the more I come down on this idea that it is so foundational that it's hard to look at the earth you know, again, using the earth as this idea of a foundation and as something that's just always there, it's hard to look down at the ground and understand and capture it all because it's so big and vast. No, I think you did a really good job of covering it. I do think, you know, this outward focus that you have, you know, as started with that last one, focused outward towards the success of the mission and that of your people. Yes, you have to take care of you, but if you're too self-centered, I don't think that's character. You know, you can have good morals, good ethics, pursue good, but it be all about you. And I think that's the only thing I'd really add to your list here is that it's directed outwards. You know, again, fulfilling our our core values of service for self. I think that's the one thing I would add. Yeah, absolutely. My cadets have heard me say this time and time again. It's not about you. It is about the mission and it's about the people around you. Yes, you do have to take care of yourself. You have to be proficient. You have to be capable, but it is not about you. Yep, that's one of my favorites as well. All right, Reed. So we kind of have this idea of character, at least something that we can work with. But now I want to talk about this idea of, of it being a foundation. Now, a foundation is something that you build on. If you think of it in terms of construction, the foundation is going to be your strongest material, your heaviest material. It's the thing that goes at the bottom. Usually in construction, it's going to be some sort of concrete that is buried deep under the ground. Or maybe you use pylons or something that is anchored deep into the bedrock itself, into the earth, as you mentioned. So with this idea in mind of a foundation, how is it that character is a foundation for officership? How is it that this idea of character, kind of, you know, as the academy describes it, you know, living honorably, lifting others, elevating performance, or as I kind of defined it, having a moral code or ethical center, a conviction or passion for the good and the true, a genuine care for people. How do these different principles, these different elements enable an officer to execute the mission, lead airmen, manage resources, or 
improve the unit? What do you think there, Reed? I think it centers on the idea of trust. I think it centers on that concept almost alone. When men and women sign up to join the Air Force, they are, in every sense of the word, entrusting their lives to this organization. And as part of the organization who's responsible for leading them, they are truly handing us their lives. And if they do not trust you, we have lost. And I know that sounds really melodramatic, but that is what it centers on for me. It's all about trust. And that comes down to small and simple things, right? Like if I'm flying in formation, I trust that my wingmen have done the training to the level required for us to not crash and die. I trust that the security forces airmen guarding the gate are trained sufficiently that they are doing their job so that I can do mine. I trust that when I ask a question of an airman that they're going to give me a true statement enough that I can act on that to make decisions or to inform combatant commanders. Can you imagine if we worked in an organization where a four-star general who's making life and death decisions didn't know if they could trust the advice they were getting? Can you imagine working in that kind of environment? I simply could not do it. That is why it's foundational. It is all about trust. You know, when the students arrive at OTS, lots of yelling, lots of screaming. And one of the first things that happen when they meet their flight commanders, we have what's called flight commander welcome. And that is the moment for you as the flight commander to kind of lay the ground rules, the context and background for how you like to teach. You know, is your moment to give an elevator speech that really mattered, that kind of set the class on the path that you wanted it to go. And one of the first things I told them is that I inherently trusted them because they had raised their hands, swore an oath they were wearing the same uniform as me. And I had to trust them unless they gave me reasons not to trust them. And I think that's what it starts with. When I see someone across the way and they're wearing the same uniform as I am, I inherently trust them. I have to, or else we simply couldn't operate. What are your thoughts on that? I think you're hitting it right on the head that if you can't trust the people around you, it makes it very difficult for you to do any of the things that the Air Force requires or anything that we've described as the things that the Air Force values. If you don't trust the people to your right and to your left, your ability to execute the mission is significantly decreased. If not your ability, certainly your motivation. But you don't want to be there because you, you feel like you're in danger, you feel like you're not safe, or you're just like, these are not my people. This is not my tribe. And I don't want to be around them. I want to be with my people. I want to be with my tribe, my family. And I think you're absolutely right. Trust is central to all of that. It makes me think about Secretary Powell, Colin Powell. There's a YouTube video out there of, I think it's called like Colin Powell on leadership or something like that. And there's a news reporter who asks him, you know, what does he think about leadership? How did he become the leader that he is today? And without missing a beat, he immediately responds, it's about trust. And I'm not going to you know, completely quote the video there. I'll post it in the show notes, link it in the Facebook group, and we can discuss it there. But the way that he describes trust as it relates to being an officer and being a leader in the military, I think is exactly what we're looking for. That if trust is in place, because there is that character in place, then as he says, people will follow you if only out of curiosity. No, that's great. You know, in my experience, especially at officer training school, right, we're deliberately creating environments and purposefully evaluating people on this. This was a pass-fail assessment. If I did not trust these airmen, they were not going to be airmen. That was the bottom line. Not just airmen, but not leaders of airmen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're civilians. They weren't going to be officers. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very few times did I observe anything that actually was a violation of trust, a loss of integrity. And when they did, they were quickly escorted out. A lot of times, you know, a lack of integrity wasn't the root cause. A lot of times there were miscommunications, misunderstandings, sometimes technical problems and honest mistakes. You know, sometimes people make mistakes and that doesn't necessarily mean they 
lack integrity and you know have violated trust. I do have one story I want to share, and this happened while I was a student, just to kind of paint the picture of how seriously we take this. So when I was there, and I'm going to be deliberately vague to you know protect some folks, but I'll do my best to kind of share the story, but I think I can communicate the main principles. There was a set of electronic equipment that was used to monitor parts of the campus. And the students at the time, we were kind of manning this post, if you will, you know, kind of part of our duties, you know, just one of those things you do at basic military training, you man posts and you run things. And there were two students that were manning this location and they had been given specific standing orders not to touch this specific electronic system. Very clear, very understood. I mean, it's literally posted on the door of this bit of kit, like under no circumstance will any students touch, monitor, do anything to this. Just leave it alone. At the time, it wasn't working. And one of these two students before officer training school actually worked for the company that built and installed this system. So they were literally a trained professional on the system. And one of the students, knowing that they could fix it, broke the standing order, got into the system and fixed it. An instructor came by, noticed that the system was working right? That's good, right? We solved the problem, but knew that it must have been a student who had done it. That's not good, right? Because there was an existing standing order not to touch the system. So the staff member confronted the two students in the room. And this is probably the most interesting part. Asked both of them, did one of you touch the system? And the student who had repaired it said nothing. The student who was in the room while it happened, but didn't say anything, said, sir, I watched another student touch the system and I did not stop them. Now, which of those two is displaying character? It's clear, right? It's the student who knew that a rule had been violated, even though they didn't do it and owned up to that. The staff member could tell something was going on, interviewed both of them again separately, and only after the second interview did the students say, yes, sir, I touched the system. But the damage was done to that person's integrity. And that person was not invited to continue with training. So just think about that, right? We have a system that's broken. Someone solved the problem, but in doing so, they lied basically by not saying anything. They lied about their involvement and allowed another person to take the fall for them. And the way that worked out gave me confidence and hope that I was joining a program I wanted to be a part of. And I think that's one thing that has really stuck with me is this is so important. It is a go, no go criteria for officership. It is absolutely essential. And the only times that I really started to question someone's ability to be an officer in the Air Force when I was an instructor at OTS was when I saw things that made me question whether or not I could trust them. Yeah, I'm with you, Reed. My experience has been that very few officers I've interacted with in the Air Force have lacked the character needed to be in the Air Force. I think that is one of the wonderful things about our organization is that the default is that you can trust them. You may know nothing about them. You may have never worked with them. You just arrived on station five minutes ago but you know that you can trust the people that are around you because it is so fundamental. It is so foundational to what it is that we do in the Air Force. But I have to ask, Reed, if everything is built on this foundation of character, where does failure as an officer occur? Are character flaws as the lack of character or lack of specific parts of the character that we have tried to describe the source of mission failure? Is character flaws or a lack of character the source of poor leadership, the source of fraud, waste, and abuse, the source of stagnation within a unit? What do you think about that? If character is so foundational and central to every success that we have, is it also central to every failure that we have? What do you think there? I'm going to vote yes. Put me down for one yes, Alex. (laughs) Yes for 100. Uh, What is yes? We'll continue (laughs) with this theme. So I think let's go back, you know, to our earlier discussion on what the Academy defines as character. 
the sum of those qualities of moral excellence which move a person to do the right thing despite pressures to the contrary. If you are failing to use resources appropriately and you are fraud, waste, and abuse, there was some sort of pressure likely to enrich yourself or an organization that you are associated with or someone else that you care about and you failed to do that. That is, to me, a failure of your moral compass. And so I do. I think that, especially the types of failures that tend to make the front page of the Air Force Times, you know, these wing commanders and, and others that are getting fired and very high-profile type of failures, those things, to me, tend to center around character faults where they have gotten misguided or ego has gotten in the way or any other number of things. I have very, very rarely seen a true lack of competence lead to mission failure. It has happened. It is very uncommon. And that is understood. I have seen people give their honest best and that best not be good enough. The reaction to those types of failures is entirely different than when someone tries to hide or tries to cheat or tries to skirt around or not do the right thing very different reactions. And I do think that it is the source of most significant failures of leadership. Well, just picking up your failure due to competence, as an officer, your responsibility is to organize, train, and equip your people. And if they are failing, it's because you have failed to correctly organize them, train them, or equip them. And that failure is then, if we're in agreement, that mission success or mission failure comes from character. Your people's failure is because of a failure in your character and your responsibility towards that organization, training and equipment of your people. I tend to agree largely. A couple of things I do want to throw out. Enemy gets a vote, right? If an aircraft gets shot down because the enemy was better than we are, I don't necessarily think that's a failure of character, right? That led to that mission failure. So let's throw that out there. Enemy gets a vote. There's fog and friction and, you know, a number of other things that can lead to mission failure. And I think we're on the same page here. But what I'm getting at is when there is a failure that is not necessarily caused by external circumstances, right? You have observed someone trying to perform the mission and they're honestly giving it all they've got then yes, I do think that someone put them in that position to fail. Sometimes that's not the case, right? They've gone through the training, they've passed, maybe it was close, and maybe they just don't have that stick to or that perseverance necessary to deliver. You know, I remember deployed, watching someone who had been through the exact same training I had, done well, but was unable to perform in a very stressful situation. That's a hard thing to train and evaluate for when they did fine in training. But when it came to game day, that was a different thing. And because they were working and really trying, that was a little bit different than, oh, someone must have pencil whipped your training, you know, because we all knew that that hadn't happened. So yeah, but I do think a lot of the biggest mission failures can be traced back to people who have decided to mail it in at some point. Yeah, I agree with you. I like how you explained it, that the enemy gets a vote and that fog and friction, these external factors will play into mission success, mission failure. Sometimes we just get lucky. And unlucky. And unlucky. Yep. But even the best luck will not overcome a lack of character. And sometimes having character in place can overcome even the worst luck. Yep. I'll totally agree with that. Can we say it that way? Is that? I think so. Am I putting myself way too far out there or? No, I agree with that. You know, there's a guy I worked with at OTS. It's, um, he was a big advocate of saying that the best led military will win the next war. And I, I think that's oversimplified, but I also think there's a grain of truth there. Sure. And I think that's kind of what we're getting at is this is so fundamental and so central. And I know we've said that over and over again throughout this episode, but it must be stated over and over again that this is the starting point. There is no other starting point than this trust, than this foundation of character. And again, I want to emphasize for our audience, I have overwhelmingly experienced very positive things in this arena. Some of the darkest moments in my Air Force career have been when I felt that this wasn't in place. 
I hope that doesn't happen to any member of the Air Force. It likely will again. And I hope we continue to get better and root those kinds of things out. But I hope our audience has, you know, taken this circular discussion that we've had today about the importance of character. Yeah. So if we're in agreement that the source of mission success or failure can at least be somewhat influenced by the presence or lack of character. Then there are a couple other questions that are on my mind that I don't know I have good answers to. First one up, how do we train for character in our commissioning sources? Are we doing a good job? Are we doing it right? How can we do it better? I don't know that I have a good answer for that. Or are we just expecting that the necessary character traits needed for mission success are already in place when our cadets show up? Yes to both, question mark, right? It's tough. These are tough questions. I think, well, keep going. You've got some more questions and then I'll give my thoughts. Yeah, so then in combination with that, once our cadets have commissioned, they are now officers in the Air Force. How do we continue to develop their character? Is it something that is trainable? Is it something that can be developed? I believe it is. So how do we do that? Or do we think that character is set, that your moral foundation, your moral code, your ethical principles are set and they don't change and you just carry them with you through your entire career? Yeah, for me, again, this is not the panacea, but I think what we do is we reward examples of good character. We highlight them when we see them. And we savagely punish those of lacking character. And I think that is how we do it. And to me, what I find is that some of the biggest sources of concern or consternation or frustration that I hear amongst my peers is when they observe what they believe to be someone with a lack of character somehow skirting by or even, you know, hopefully not, but sometimes getting rewarded. And those who seem to be doing the right thing not getting recognized for that, or maybe even punished. And I think that is the right way to manage it. And if we create a culture and an environment where it's just simply expected, I think that's the best way to do it by rewarding those that do it right and getting rid of those who do it wrong. Who gets to decide if we're doing it right? I think we've had this conversation, right, (laughs) Colin? That's what makes us a profession. Those of us who are in the club. But who's to say that those of us that are in the club have it right? I mean, are are we saying that character is relative? The type of character that we are looking for is specific to the Air Force. I don't think that I have a good answer for these questions. Yeah, I don't either. But I do know that we're in at a time when leadership is asking these exact questions. And again, that just gives me hope. I'm in the right place when someone else at the very top is asking that exact question right now. This whole memo that we've been talking about for the last four or five weeks all centers around this idea of, hey, I don't think we're getting this right. And that gives me hope for the future. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of where I was hoping to end up with this whole discussion is that just as we don't have the answers, but we're looking for them, so are our leaders at the highest level of the Department of the Air Force which now includes the Air Force and the Space Force, are looking for these answers. How do we ensure that the people that we bring into the service and those that we keep in the service are meeting our requirements that that have the characteristics and the traits that we value in an Air Force officer? I like the way that the A1, Lieutenant General Brian Kelly, I like the way that he likes to put it, that he is... 100% confident that we don't have it 100% right. Yeah. But that we're working toward it. Yeah. I saw him say that at, uh, in the recording of the Air Force Association conferences last year. Yeah. That's great. I think that that requires some extreme humility and it is a demonstration of character at the highest level of what it is that we're trying to do here. We're trying to find the best people and keep the best people, those that have this character that are able to execute the mission, lead airmen, manage resources, and improve the unit. That's the whole purpose of this entire memo. That's the whole purpose of this discussion that we've had over the last two months. Yeah, absolutely. And I can't emphasize it enough how exciting a time it is to be in the Air Force and now the Space Force for some of those who were ceremoniously made 
part of the Space Force by the signature of our Commander-in-Chief. Exciting times, Colin. Yeah, so I'm with you, Reed. I'm super excited. We're both re really excited. We hope that you, our audience, are really excited about what 2020 has in store for us, the, the years that will follow as we move forward in our individual careers, as you move forward in your career as an officer already in the Air Force or the Space Force, or as someone who wants to join this profession. We encourage you to stick along, stay here with us, be part of this discussion. Join us in our Facebook group. Come tell us what it is that you think about what it means to have character and how it is foundational to these other things that we're trying to accomplish as officers in the Air Force. We would love to have that discussion with you. We hope that you will share this information with other people who are similarly interested or engaged, that they can learn from you, learn from us, about what it means to have character. And we can encourage each other in our efforts to execute the mission, do these things that the Air Force needs. Anything else you want to say there, Reed, as we wrap up this discussion about General Goldfein's memo? If you want to become part of history, come on over, talk to a recruiter, get your package in. It's one of the best things about being in this job. And uh, thank you for listening to this week's episode of Commissionette.